how this structure correlates with the crystal structure that I showed you on this page. So very cool. Proteins obviously can fold inside that enormous cavity. Oh, we're shifting gears now. So the chaperones assist protein folding in vivo, both de novo and as a result of uh, stresses on the system. Let's think about what happens to proteins that are destined for uh, de degradation. And this may be because, well, maybe because they are uh, uh, becoming partially unfolded, or maybe there are other signals that lead to their, lead to their degradation. But I wanted to wind up this talk with uh, ubiquitination and protein degradation. It seemed like a, a nice bookend for thinking about protein folding is the, the birth of proteins and the death of proteins. Ubiquitin is a protein signal. Here's this primary sequence cartoon. You see a whole lot of lysines here. Um, lysines are important for its function. Uh, we'll intimate that in a moment. Here's the structure of a dimeric uh, ubiquitin molecule. Um, polymerized via this N-terminal glycine to this particular lysine residue. I'm trying to remember which lysine it is. I want to say it's K11. Um, in any case, uh, we can see how uh, we can polymerize ubiquitin very easily. And from this cartoon over here, we see how important ubiquitin, um, polyubiquitination of molecules is to the fate of a particular molecule. So here we got four different possibilities. This guy is monoubiquitinated, can lead to a variety of processes, inc uh, including cellular localization, um, including uh, endocytosis, etc. Polyubiquitination uh, via lysine 48 can lead to proteosomal degradation. So this is the part of the story that we really are going to care about. But there are other kinds of polyubiquitination, uh, both linear and branched, using a variety of, of these other lysines. Right? You remember that the lysine is critical for determining the structure of the polyubiquitin polymer. Um, and these can also lead to endocytosis, uh, activation of, of other processes, interaction perhaps with the ribosome. But for us, let's think about the death of proteins, degradation within the proteasome from this polyubiquitin tail that appears or is tagged on the surface of some protein substrate. We won't go into the, the machinery of ubiquitination in this lecture. That we will save for future lectures. Today, what I want to set us up for is the proteasome. And I really want to end with the proteasome today because um, of its clear structural relationship to the chaperonins. Now, okay, it's different, right? And it has a different function, and we won't, we won't talk about the, there being a real evolutionary relationship, but clearly there's a functional uh, uh, relationship here. We have this catalytic toroid, in this case for, uh, for degradation of the polypeptide, and then we have these end caps that are involved in translocation. So forget about the nomenclature here. We have PA26 in this particular figure. Generally, we consider that the 19S regulatory particle has an ATPase function that allow that the ATPase functionality is important for unfolding and pumping, translocating the, the unfolded protein into the, the core particle, the 20S proteasome particle itself. Also involves some deubiquitinating enzymes. Here's the key polyubiquitin receptor recognizing the protein that was to be degraded by the presence of that polyubiquitin tail. A set of enzymes that remove the ubiquitin so that it perhaps can go on and, and target other proteins for destruction. But then once we're present in the 20S proteasome, we have our proteolytic active sites um, where we degrade that protein into typically, I think it's seven residue chunks. In any case, um, assembled by a whole host of chaperones and a whole, there's a whole host of alternative organizations uh, to this molecule that determine uh, precisely what the function of the proteasome is. Again, I don't want to get in too deeply into those details today, just to give you the sense that there's an, there's an end to the life of a protein that, that uh, is its degradation by this proteasomal um, machinery. Just zooming in, um, the real reason to show you this is to uh, set you up for the degradation uh, 
mechanism that, that I show in the next slide. The threonine, of, of course, is going to play a role, but we see that there are multiple active sites here in red where the catalysis, that proteolysis, is going to take place. So we're skipping ahead a little bit in terms of our preparation to enzyme mechanisms, but we've looked at proteolytic mechanisms before. We're going to see them again. Um, the first thing that happens in the proteasome is that it, it's, it auto-activates auto itself, exposing an N-terminal threonine via hydrolysis of this propeptide. That happens via the activation of this hydroxyl residue. So what do we got here? Well, it's a threonine, right? So the threonine side chain, the hydroxyl group, is activated by a water molecule, abstracts a proton ready for nucleophilic attack on that peptide carbonyl. Now that we've exposed that amino group of the that of the now we have an N-terminal amino al alpha amino group of the of that threonine one. Um, the serine st is still act the side chain of the serine or the threonine is still the critical player. In this case, though, it's activated by the deprotonation of a water molecule by the alpha amino group. Right. Remember what that means in terms of what the pKa of that amino group actually is. Right? What do we th usually think of this as being? Well, in this case, it's going to be protonated after it abstracts a proton from water. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 that water now attacks the serine hydroxyl proton, again resulting in activation of that serine oxygen so that it can then now attack the not its own peptide carbonyl, but the peptide carbonyl of a substrate molecule. So. In, in any case, it's all about the activation of that, of that hydroxyl, just like with the serine proteases, these threonine proteases have to get activated somehow. Just thought it was a cute story. So that's, that's as much as we're going to say about degradation of proteins by the, by the proteasome. Let's turn for a few moments, though, to uh, misfolding and aggregation. So the failure of the aforementioned processes. What aforementioned processes? Well, the assisted folding and the degradation of proteins can lead to disease states. So misfolding can lead to degradation and loss of function. Um, this is just by way of saying that not all protein folding diseases are amyloid based. Um, cystic fibrosis is an example of the accumulation of a, of a protein that, that is uh, misfolded. Um, but misfolding can also lead to un uncontrolled aggregation. So again, we're not forming well-defined amyloids. Instead, we're forming this, these, ag uh, these aggregates. These uncontrolled aggregations can be soluble aggregates, or they can be insoluble. So yeah, so here what we're really talking about are amyloidogenic diseases that result in amyloid fiber formation, which result in amyloidoses or the disease states uh, that result from amyloid formation. What are amyloids? Well, they're, they have common structural features. That is to say that there are structural features that are common to many, many amyloids. That consist of this so-called cross beta spine. These are laminated beta sheets and uh, also known as steric zippers. And it's a little bit hard to see in this picture. I'll show you again in the next slide. But what we see are two beta sheets that are stacked against one another. Um, this is the core of many, many, uh, many, many amyloid structures. They lead to the formation of, of filaments that and fibrils and fibers. Very can be very large scale structures that lead to a variety of kinds of diseases. What are these amyloidogenic diseases? Well, first of all, let's say that the amyloid formation can be transmissible and it can be toxic. Definitely toxic, sometimes transmissible. Some transmissible diseases that we can associate with amyloid formation are prion-based diseases, bovine, um, spongiform encephalopathy, we've probably heard of, mad cow disease can lead to neurodegeneration. So the formation of these amyloids can result in um, tissue necrosis in the brain. Alzheimer's disease, similarly, the formation of an amyloidogenic peptide known as A-beta, actually a degradation product of a larger protein known as amyloid precursor protein, again leads to amyloid formation and Alzheimer's disease. Um, amylin and transerethrin are not transmissible diseases, but they're still amyloidogenic diseases that have severe effects 
um, severe pathologies. But so the etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, the point I'm getting at here is that there are a whole host of amyloidogenic diseases or amyloid-based diseases. Um, some of them are very familiar to us, but but in any case, the ability of proteins to misfold and aggregate in complicated ways uh, is the basis of, of much disease and therefore of much of much study. Let's look closer at that cross beta spine structure. So this is a structure from David Eisenberg's lab. He brought us the leucine zipper oh so many years ago. Similar kind of thing happening here. Um, we see a so here are two strands from two different beta sheets. Um, you say this the same sequence, right? Asin, asin, glen, tur, and we see that there's a dry face, right? Even though these are polar residues, they're interdigitated with each other so firmly that they've excluded all water. And then there's a wet face, okay? And then this structure can be propagated in three dimensions, forming these very large aggregated structures. So somehow, a misfolding event occurs and we lose some structure. When we've lost that structure, what do what do so many proteins tend to fo to form these these beta extended structures that, that ultimately lead to the f to fibril formation? What else do I want to say about this? So interesting work also from uh, David Eisenberg David Eisenberg's lab at UCLA is that all proteins have the pro propensity to form amyloid. It's a bit of a scary thought, but what he did was his group did was come up with an algorithm that defines the fibrillation propensity for a, for a particular sequence and then they looked at all sequences and th they've got three genomes here as well as the PDB look at you can look at the size of the relative size of these different genomes 4,000 genes 4,000 open reading frames in coli 40,000 in humans and you see that they find these sequence elements that tend to be have a high fibrillation propensity or HP in virtually all proteins all proteins now what do they do how do they prove this well so they found a consensus sequence that determines that effectively determines your propensity to form amyloid and they score that and we don't care what this energy is but basically orange and red uh, scores mean that we have a high propensity to form amyloid so here's a particular sequence doesn't matter what protein this is but if they cut out this particular sequence and synthesize it then boom, amyloid formation easily. Similarly, they take this sequence, ASSNY, boom, amyloid formation. Now, if they take a sequence with a low possibility of forming amyloid, they go they get no amyloid. Maybe they get precipitates, not hard to form protein precipitates, but they don't get amyloid. Interesting thing about this little sequence element is that if you rearrange the order of amino acids to match uh the to into a, a, a let me see what I'm trying to say. If you rearrange the sequence into a, a high HP sequence, then again you get amyloid. So it's not just the sequence composition; it's the actual order of amino acids that gets you your amyloid comp, uh, uh, forming propensity. So why don't all proteins form amyloids then? Well, lots do, and lots lead to disease, but obviously all proteins don't form amyloids or we wouldn't be here. The upshot of this research, is, which is very interesting, is that these sequences are often buried, often involved in other interactions, strong and, and tight interactions, that uh, prevent self-aggregation. So the idea here is that we can't avoid these HP sequences. They're very common throughout nature. Instead, what we evolve is a mechanism of self-chaperoning those structures to prevent aggregation. So we've ended up on an evolutionary note to take us back, relate us back to the previous lectures. Um, before I let me wind up then by saying that in biochemistry, it's important to study model systems in isolation. So we have thermodynamic models of protein stability and kinetic models of protein folding that allow us to make generalizations about the way proteins fold. That is to say, they form via well-defined intermediates, they fold along pathways, they structures nucleate, and those nucleating structures um, form quickly if, if the structure is short range, slowly if the structure is long range, 
But it's important, even as biochemists, for us to think about the way that proteins fold in vivo. And when we look at in vivo protein folding, it's important to think about what's happening on the ribosome. It's all well and good to fold and unfold proteins in a test tube, but proteins in nature are folding on the ribosome. So what's controlling that process? Well, often, not always, but often, it's molecular chaperones. So it's important for us to understand the roles of molecular chaperones in shepherding non-native polypeptides into their native structures and rescuing stressed proteins and allowing them to reform their native structures. Um, many proteins and many diseases arise from the formation of amyloid, and that's effectively precipitation. Um, the precipitation has many different kinds of outcomes. Some of those actually result in neurodegeneration. There are a variety of other pathologies that result from amyloid formation. Um, but it's interesting to think about what leads to protein aggregation and maybe what prevents protein aggregation in more cases. So we'll leave it there. Hope you enjoy it. Have a good weekend.